Yokozuna felt nervous the day of the casket match. After what happened at the 1993 Survivor Series, he was convinced that The Undertaker was the Grim Reaper himself. The massive superstar made sure his American spokesman, Jim Cornette, gave interviews that reflected a forceful and confident attitude. No one knew of Yokozuna's concerns. Yokozuna sat in the locker room listening to his manager, Mr. Fuji, and Jim Cornette. No one can defeat you, Mr. Fuji assured him. You weigh over 560 pound. Crush him with bonsai splash quickly. No one ever survived that. Yokozuna felt confident as he entered the ring. No fear. Then the lights went out, and the Undertaker appeared at ringside with his manager, Paul Bearer, and a massive dong. <laughs> I added that part. Next to a huge casket made specifically for Yokozuna by the Undertaker himself. It was wheeled to ringside. I lost my place there. Yokozuna attacked without warning! Really, how does Yokozuna sneak up on you? He's really spry for a 507,000 whatever. I don't know. He's a big fucking guy. You seen this guy? My god. I saw this one time. It was probably more than one time. But like, he, he, he does this thing where he goes on the top rope and he just like basically drops off the top rope. The bonsai drop. And he just like sits on you. But like, sometimes he wouldn't be able to like pull his, you know, be able to like stop himself. And... There's this video, he just like crushes this guy, and you see his rib cage just flatten. And I'm amazed this guy lived. Oh my god, anyway. <laughs> he attacked without warning. He sent the Undertaker crashing down with a clothesline, with a capital C, clothesline. And then Irish whipped him. Irish whipped himself and delivered a 568 pound leg drop. They really like to hit that over 560 pound thing. Leg drop with a capital L. This must be a German thing. The Germans always like to put a capital letter on all their nouns. Next came a crushing abdominal splash. Capital letters on both of those. Then he dragged the Undertaker to the corner. But corner is not capitalized. It's, it's only the moves. The moves are capitalized, okay? And squashed his motionless foe with the dreaded bonsai splash finishing maneuver. Yokozuna breathed a sigh of relief. The only thing left to do was put him in the casket. Suddenly, Paul Bearer raised the funeral urn he was carrying and called out, Oh, yes! Fear paralyzed Yokozuna as the Undertaker arose and slowly stepped toward him, grinning. The World Wrestling Federation basic adventure game. Wait, what happened? How did it end? How, what the fuck? Damn it! Now we'll never know how it ended. Who won the fucking casket match? Damn! Well, anyway. This is, uh... This is, uh... Basically some reviews of... The only two wrestling games that I'm aware of. I'm sure there are other wrestling games. Probably not that many, but at least the only two... Officially licensed WWF wrestling games that I know of. There may have been a WWE one. I don't think so, though. But um, this one is probably much more well-known. I, I showed this in my uh, VCR WWF VCR WrestleMania game, which was a pile of dog shit. But the uh, White Lantern Macho Man Randy Savage showed me this one. This was made uh, when the, you know, when, when the D20 system was, you know, when the D20 system had first come out and the, the big buzzword was, you know, the, the open gaming license, you know, they, they were very keen on, you know, the D20 system was wide open. Anyone could make anything for it. You know, anyone could use the D20 system for anything. And so of course anyone and everyone did. So anything under the sun was built into the D20 system, like literally anything you there was there was a Bible uh, campaign setting, of, actually, which wasn't that bad, I, all things considered, if you were into that kind of thing. I don't, don't know anyone who was. Although, which would be kind of awesome to play some New Testament now that I think about it. But anyway. Um, and WWF, no... Wait, this is WWE. It is WWE. World Wrestling Entertainment. Huh. I did not know that. Man, this WWE thing goes back further than I thought. Man, I'm old. No, but, um, yeah, World Wrestling Entertainment. 
But um, I'll, I'll talk about this one in a second. In fact, I'm probably going to... Yeah, I'll start with this one. Um, but yeah, Know Your Role was one of the many, 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 way too many D20 system uh, open gaming license games by, I guess, by Comic Images that was released. And we didn't have any illusions back when this came out. We knew that the vast majority of open gaming license stuff released back then was largely crap. You know, uh, the, the, you know, we, the, the major stuff was largely crap. You know, most people did not like D20 system stuff. You know, um, Dungeons and Dragons, when it was third edition, most people who at least were old schoolers didn't like it. Um, even new schoolers didn't think it was that great. Um, because it had balance issues. And I've gone over this hundreds of times already. No doubt you've heard me go on about, go on about it. But, you know, that was when the game was designed well. So you can imagine what it's like when essentially you've got people like me turned loose and just house ruling the crap out of it. And, I mean, this was designed, you know, this, again, this was probably turned loose on by a fairly professional studio. So, uh, but, you know, th there was a lot of games. I, I think I got rid of most of them that were kind of the, you know, I got D20 Afghanistan, stuff like that. Um, I, I got that mainly for the setting. You know, you'll notice I do that a lot, is I get a lot of really strange books, but I don't get them for the rules. I get them for the maps. You know, I'll get, I'll buy a lot of, uh, I'll buy a lot of uh, adventure modules or, or, you know, dungeon books or really crappy, uh, you know, campaign settings, but I'll get them for the fluff. You know, I'll get them for maps. I just kind of pillage stuff like a salad bar, you know, um, but anyway, this was one of the many things, and nobody had any illusions that this was going to be any good, and guess what, it's not, it's not, it's not any good at all, but this is one of those games, like much of the D20 boom, that y you look at this and you're like, who would ever play this, and the answer is really nobody, because you you think about this, and you can never really see yourself getting a group together and playing some WWE Know Your Role. So, the first question I started thinking about is, like, when would you break this out? And the first answer is, like, well, I can think of a few times. And the first is, like, just a quick one-off. You know, if you if you got if you got everyone together and you just want to play, you know, if, you know, somebody doesn't show up, like, the DM doesn't show up, and you just want to kind of, you know, fuck around and just kind of role play a quick little show yeah i can see that you break this out and it's d20 everyone knows the d20 rules generally speaking so you, you get this out and you play it and you hope it's good it's not um but there you go um and i'll get to why this one isn't isn't very good in a second it's, it's bad for a lot of reasons the other one is and this is one that some of you may not even know this exists but there's a thing called an e-fed and that's called a it's it's kind of a it's kind of the the backyard wrestling of um, of online role playing, you know what I mean? So it's like an EFED is sort of like uh, role playing this sort of thing on a message board, to where although it's I think it's, it it how how structured it is is as broad of a spectrum as you can as you can hope for. Some of them are very rigidly enforced in terms of rules. Some of them are literally just, you know, everyone just kind of gets together and narrates on their own what happens. They just kind of get together. More often than not, though, I think it's just kind of, there's just like a core core group of two or three people who just kind of book things. You know, they um, they they just kind of book the matches on, a, on, on like a show, and then they just let people, you know, cut promos on each other, and then somebody either like writes up the match like whoever's in charge like writes up the match results kind of a little story and then you know so tells who you know tells how the story goes or some of them i've actually the one i was in one yeah believe it or not i was um some of them actually have like random generators that show that kind of take little bits of statistics and then kind of roll little combat rules out. i have no idea how the how those work you know how they I don't know what system they run on because it wasn't this and it wasn't anything that I've ever seen, but they have those little rules designed. And so that, you know, they just kind of generate an either an automatic winner or somebody kind of writes a little narrative up 
to kind of match the outcome of the of the match and um yeah so the problem with those is and it actually is the same problem with a lot of larping is that a lot of people um are displeased with their position in the e-fed and i started to realize it's because it's very it's very political this is my macho man hat and it's too small for my gigantic melon head <sighs> um it's it's the same thing with a lot of larping is that uh that it's it's kind of run by a core group of friends and if you're not in that core group you kind of don't matter unless you you know become you kind of don't matter you're just kind of a supporting player and then i started to realize that's like larping and then i started to realize that's a lot like wrestling in general isn't it you know uh you know if, if you're not kind of buddy buddy with triple h or the mcmahon's you uh you're kind of held down so I was like, you know, E-Feds in, in, are kind of a microcosm of the real wrestling. It's not that far off. Um, so I, I started to kind of admire E-Feds for as, as fucked up and as unbalanced and as kind of petty and childish as they are. At least the one, at least the one I was in, very briefly. It wasn't long. I was just kind of fooling around. But uh, it, actually, I, I, will tell you the, I will tell you the short, funny story of the two characters I played in that one. Which, yeah... Um, anyway, it's, 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 it was almost like a reverse psychology thing in this E-Fed. Um, the first character I started off playing was, I was actually trying to make like kind of a, fuck this hat. I was actually trying to make like a competitive character. And so I wanted to make some guy who was kind of like a hardcore character, I think. And so I, I made a guy who was kind of like, um, I, I, was, I was, I don't know what I was thinking. I was like, I was trying to go for a guy like Raven kind of a kind of a cult of personality type guy you know um not like cm punk more like raven who kind of surrounded himself he was like a cow my guy was like a coward who surrounded himself with people who was kind of passing judgment on people you know he was very you know he, he he was he was considered everyone else to be you know pathetic and and you know not quite sinners, but like he, he saw weakness in everybody and he was just like, you, you know, you're pathetic, you're wrong. You know, he was, he was morally judging everybody. And so he it was kind of a mixture of like right to censor, but not quite, you know, was, whatever. So the problem is as soon as I, uh, about, about like a month after I started doing this thing, uh, SmackDown started, uh, pr promoing a character named Mordecai and Mordecai was like my character cranked up to 11 and I was so horrified by what, by what my character might become, I dumped him immediately. I was like, oh my god, I made Mordecai. No, no! So yeah, my first character was Mordecai. Ah! At least I can say I came up with Mordecai first, so it's my fault. If, if in case somebody from the WWE was watching. Blame me for that. I am Mordecai. I always called him Mordecai, I don't know why. But yeah, um, my second guy um, was, was I probably, I, I think, I think I ripped this character off as well, but I did it without knowing it. Um, you'll notice I do that a lot too. Um, the second character, I wanted to make a guy who never won. Uh, so basically I made, uh, I, I made a guy, uh, oh no, I had three characters. No, I had three characters. Um, I, I wanted to make a bad guy who I always like playing villains. So I wanted to make a character uh, who called himself everybody's hero. So he was, he was always a character who was sticking his nose in everybody's business, trying to help out everybody. The only problem was he was always really unwelcome. So he was always like, you know, he, he was always helping out the wrong side, you know? So, so he was always being very judgmental. You know, if he ever perceived somebody was disrespecting somebody else, you know, he would always, you know, challenge that person to a fight. Or, you know, uh, if he perceived somebody was being bullied by somebody else, he was being the hero. He's like, don't worry, I'm everybody's hero. And so he'd stick his head in. And so it was really not a very good gimmick. And so he didn't last very long anyway. But it was actually a lot of fun to play because it, was, it, was, it played really well on the message board. But, you know, it was, it was kind of a silly gimmick and he didn't really go anywhere. Um, he was actually, he was a lot better in terms of, like, kind of a manager role. But anyway, I didn't, I didn't like him nearly as much either. 
So the third guy I wanted to do was uh, I wanted to make a character who always lost. I wanted to make the ultimate jobber. So basically what I wanted to do was I always liked in wrestling shows um, whenever somebody was backstage or the, I, I, I always liked when somebody like the bad guy wants to get his championship belt and like run off or when, you know, the guy picks up the timekeeper and throws him off to get like the, the ring bell and hit somebody. There's, there's almost always some guy who gets like pushed out of the way or, you know, some guy who gets bullied and like choke slam, like a camera guy or something like that. I always wanted to have like a guy who's like cleaning up the ring or a guy who's setting up the ring. And so I always wanted there to be a guy who's like, like I wanted a character who for some reason during every show would just get fixated on or it's like for some reason just get oddly picked on by one of the bad guys every show. So I wanted to make a guy called uh, called the uh, what was he? Um, the, that the crowd the crowd would just uh, all of a sudden like really start liking this guy. So um, so he was just like the the ring guy, you know, the like the ring crew guy. So he didn't have a name. He was just the ring crew guy, you know. Uh, so he was just a guy setting up the ring. So, uh, you know, for some reason, a guy, one of the heels would lose and he'd get really frustrated and he'd start, you know, beating the shit out of, you know, he'd just go psycho and he'd start, you know, he'd, he'd choke slam the ref and, you know, my guy would be just around and he'd, he'd start cleaning the mat up and the guy, the guy would, he's like, I can't fucking stand it. He'd run back in there. You know, my guy's kind of helping the guy and he'd, just, he'd flip and like beat the shit out of my guy. But, you know, he'd, he'd just start raining chair shots on my guy and, you know, for, so that was the guy. He kind of get sympathy on this guy until finally the general manager was like, <laughs> you know, he for some reason would book my guy in a match with this other guy, and so like my guy's not a wrestler, and so I'm like, you know, I, I I'm I'm cutting a promo because like the interviewer's like sticking a mic in my face, and he's like, you know, how do you feel that you're now in a match with, with you no know, fucking Greystoke the Destroyer or whatever? And I'm like, I'm like I can't, I can't I'm not a wrestler. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't, don't want to do this. So you know. um, because in the WWF, you know, if you work in if you work in the WWF, contractually you are obligated to wrestle anybody if the management says so. <laughs> you know, of course you are, whether you be a management or a retired legend, a referee or a ring crew guy. I wish I could remember what I called him. It wasn't ring crew guy. It was um. <sighs> oh, God. I can't, uh, it was like, ah, never mind. Weird gaps in memory. Anyway, uh, it, I don't know. Anyway, so, like, I was cutting these promos where I was being a complete coward, but, uh, he got really popular because I kept getting the shit kicked out of me. My stats were, like, really, really low. But, um, and then, like, two months later, inexplicably, my character, like, I, I that was the one condition I, I, I kept telling the guys in charge, I was like, I never want to win a match. I never want to come close to winning a match. I want my guy to always, always lose. Like, and I didn't want him to be booked in matches constantly. I just wanted to be like, like occasionally, like if some guy, you know, kicks the crap out of me, I wanted to be like a joke. I wanted to be like Colin Delaney from ECW. Like he, you know, he's not going to win ever. So, you know, like, so eventually, but you know, sometimes, so like, Eventually, the big hero um, was would be like the big hero would come out and save me. And so, one of the shows, you know, the the big evil was, you know, was he he he'd formed like this big stable, and they were beating the crap out of me. And so, so you know, the management was like, if you can find anyone who can, we'll tag team partner with you. We'll get you a tag team championship match. And so. You know, the Hulk Hogan character of the time was like, how about this guy, brother, the ring crew guy? And I'm like, no, no. Before you know it, I'm tag team champion. Because, <laughs> of course, he throws my limp carcass on top of the guy and I get the three count. So, of course, I tell these guys I never want to win a single fucking match. And then three months later, I'm tag team champion, which then, yeah. So, um, I think, though, without knowing it, I had ripped off an ECW character, which I think was either... I hadn't watched ECW up until very recently at the time. Um, I either whipped, ripped off, I think Mikey Whipwreck was a lot, a lot like that. And I think there was a character maybe called like Towel Boy. 
that might have been it. I think there, yeah, I think there was a character who was like Towel Boy, who would like towel off the ring that would get the shit kicked out of him in ECW. I had not known this. Uh, but yeah, apparently I ripped off, I ripped off like one or two ECW characters without ever realizing it at the time. It was a good character. It's a really good character. Um, as I recall though, Mikey Whipwreck for a long time didn't win shit. Cause I think Mikey was like supposed to be like a complete joke of a character. Um, now he's actually, or at least I, I don't know if he's still actively wrestling, probably, but in ECW at, at some point he became like a serious contender. But yeah, for a long time, I was, as I recall, he was like just a complete joke, you know, in character, he was a complete joke. But yeah, I think, I, I think there was a character named Towel Boy or something like that, who was just like this little 98 pound weakling, who was what my character was, what I had decided my character was going to be. But I, I, apparently I had ripped him off, not com- out of complete ignorance. So, eh, whatever, that was my character. Anyway, those are my wrestling, my E-Fed stories. I, I really don't have any, I didn't have any, uh, I didn't have any bad experiences with the politics, mainly because as soon as I recognized there were politics, I stayed out of it. Um, it mainly, you know, I think the best way to deal with that kind of politics is, is to, is to recognize it and not get involved in it. Um, and so either, either you're going to, um, you got to find a way to make yourself, <sighs> to make yourself maybe friends with them you got to get yourself in there somehow if you want to stick with the group but it's it's really tough to do because otherwise it's 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 kind of a social dynamic thing you know it's i don't know i i I just found a way that that made them laugh and you know i i kind of do that so when i told them maybe it was just a way where i was like i was being very uh uh selfless you know, I gave them a character that was completely unselfish, where I was like, I always want to lose. You know, whatever happens, I want to lose. So maybe they kind of respected that or something like that. Um, you know, I was like, I, 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 I wasn't always clamoring for title shots or something like that. You know, I was like, I wasn't always like, my character is the best. My character is the Undertaker. My character is Mordecai. You know, my character is is surrounded by loyal sycophants and stuff like that. You know, my... My character is the is the is the big evil, you know. My I was like, no, my character is the pussy. <laughs> like, um, but you'll notice I, I I with with Doctor Insano and stuff like that. I Doctor Insano was pretty much the same kind of character where he Doctor Insano is a loser, you know. Doctor Insano was pretty much meant to be a guy who will always lose. I like that kind of character who who. Um, if he's good at everything, there's no room for growth. It, it's it's kind of fun to watch a guy fail and yet still kind of find a way to overcome that or at least kind of fail spectacularly or and, uh, you know, at least find some joy in it. Or it's Comedy is in watching, you know, I hate to say it, comedy is pain. Um, so it, it's, if, if you're not going to win, like let, let, let me put in that political argument there. If, if there's a lot of politics taking place in your game, like be it a LARP or, you know, your E-Fed, if you know you're going to fail, at least fail in a spectacular fashion, you know, so that was why I made Ring Crew Guy. I was just like, if I'm going to fuck, if I'm, if I'm going to fucking burn out, I want to make a guy who will just, I'm going to make Spike Dudley, who's just going to get pitched 30 rows, you know, deep into the, into the audience, you know, so that, I guess that was, but you know, that's probably not the way most of you would want to be remembered as a complete joke but i don't know at some point i became the tag team champion um that was i i didn't stick with it this was not like a really major time commitment that i was putting forth here because you know this efed thing it was just on it was on it wasn't my forum but i was just hanging out on like other forums at the time i was just it was just something i would like type on every now and then it wasn't like this big obsession of mine flashback to me like obsessively typing promos no. um anyway over here know your role this is the most appealing cover possible don't you think you've got these two incredibly ugly sweaty dudes neither of which is the rock you know you've right away the marketing of this is horrible 
because like okay first off know your role you you've got to play on words here but i don't think they understand it know your role i don't think role playing and roll dice like i don't i just don't maybe they do i get role playing but i ah i don't i just sometimes i wonder I, I would have maybe gone a different way on that one. I don't know. But anyway, I, I guess they do. But um, anyway, I guess my point is the picture on the front. This is like one of the most horrible book covers I've ever seen in my life. These two guys are fucking ugly. But at the same time, if you're going to go with The Rock's quote, know your role, put The Rock on the cover. Put somebody like photogenic on the cover. Why would you do this? Why would you put... It's like Why would you put Bob Holly? Why would you put fucking Sparky Plug front and center, grimacing in fucking agony, covered in fucking flop sweat with his big fucking teeth, right on... Ah! Ah! Yay! Yay! Why? Why would you do this? This is not good. This... You want to put somebody that'll sell books. You know, like... Put a major star on this. Like, okay, you could put Kurt Angle on this, but, like, put Kurt Angle doing his, you know, woo, you know, this. Put, like, The Rock, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Triple H, I guess. He's on the back, but, you know, Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart. They, they and you, I can do Bret Hart because they mentioned Bret Hart in this several times. Ric Flair. They mentioned Ric Flair. You know, any one of the num number of guys in here that are more fucking photogenic than... They got better pictures in here. But, like... This! Edge? They got Edge in here, but what the fuck? Bob Holly. And I think what kills me is they got characters. They got statted characters in the back of the book here. And I don't think Hardcore Holly is among them. No, no, no. Yeah, Hardcore Holly is not among the characters listed in the back of this book. So, this guy is not in the game. At least not statted in this game. But Great Cthulhu is, no. Um, so, so, at first I was dubious about this game. No shit, right? So, But, like, I'm thinking, like, oh, well, God. D20 Wrestling... So I'm thinking, when would you ever play this? Well, on one-offs, would you ever do this on an E-Fed? I don't know. Well, D20 system is kind of a miniatures combat game. Right? Because D20 was meant originally to kind of transition from AD&D, which was kind of a more abstract kind of thinking game. It wasn't, it wasn't really suited for tabletop miniatures combat. Nothing as precise as all that. Whereas the D20 system was meant to kind of make it a lot more visual and a lot more precise in terms of taking taking it to miniatures and putting them on a square grid to where you move them around. And so it's a lot more exact. You, you know, there's no ambiguity where you're moving the figures, where you're facing, you know, and range combat and shit like that. It makes it a miniatures war game, essentially. So I'm like, okay, well, could you translate this to where you're running, like, an actual E-Fed? Could you run this to where it's a lot more precise? Like, how would this translate to an actual wrestling match? Because it's a... it's a D20 system is is good for fighting. It's, it's a combat. It's basically a combat-oriented role-playing game system. You know, it's, it's a lot more slanted towards combat than role-playing. Let's put it that way. You know, it's not skill based, really. That it's where it's really flawed is skills, combat. That's where it's at. Does it do this well at all? No, because you know it. That that whole thing I told you, where it's got like speed. You know, in in D and D third edition, you know, humans have a speed rating of like thirty, meaning they can move thirty feet every round. So you've got this grid, you know, and then you know each grid is five feet you know, five by five feet, and you can move your characters that much, and is that in this? No, because, you know, your ring is obviously kind of a standard size, and so uh, what's the point of movement? You know, what's the point of having 30 feet movement in, this, in the wrestling? Well, there's no point in that. 
So you already you've you've reached a fundamental flaw in having a D20 system combat thing. So now you've got another problem in that, well, how did the skills work? If you're familiar with the D20 system at all, you've got this... When you've got skills, you've got to choose a, a class. And you're like, oh boy, a class. Well, here's where we go with the classes. And actually, the classes make a little bit of sense. Here, are, here they are. And this is actually my problem with D20 Modern. The, D, the classes in D20 Modern, it's actually not a bad game, but the classes don't make any sense to me. Anyway, multi-class characters. Yeah, right. Um, aerial Superstar. Okay, High Flyer. Uh, blazing Speed. Power Superstars. Okay. Rough Superstars, as in examples... <laughs> Examples of rough superstars. Danny Basham. Doug Basham. Booker T. Bubba Dudley. Devon Dudley. Spike Dudley. Mick Foley. Hardcore Holly. John Bradshaw Layfield. Rosie. <laughs> Tyson Tomko. Rosie. From three minute warning? Wow. That's going back. Rosie. Savvy superstar. Basically, this is the intelligence based wrestler. <laughs> Which is the. No, I'm sorry. No, Savvy is the charisma based wrestler. I think most of them are highly proficient superstars in addition to be clever and wily. That's what makes them so dangerous. Examples of savvy superstars in the WWE. John Cena. Ric Flair. Eddie Guerrero. Chris Jericho. Randy Orton. Steven Richards. The Rock. Trish, St Trish Stratus. And Triple H. <laughs> Steven Richards. <laughs> you're, in, you're, in, you're in high company, Stevie. Right to censor made it. Woo! Uh, John Cena. Well, now I don't... Charisma is the ability associated with this class, although wisdom is not far behind. Savvy superstars often place high scores in intelligence. Okay, so. <laughs> John Cena is a savvy superstar. Okay, so his primary stats, the stats that he put priority into, basically in order, were charisma... Wisdom, intelligence, and then the physical stats. Because <laughs> John Cena is not known for his uh, strength at all. No. <laughs> He's known for his great wisdom. <laughs> his great intelligence, too. Oh, my God. He's... Char Charisma, sure. Okay. Although... But his wisdom... The sage Dalai Lama-like wisdom of John Cena. I'm sure... I'm sure... I'm sure people from all around come to... To listen to sermons from John Cena. The basic thugonomics... You know, <laughs> word life. Oh my god. Triple H, you know, oh my god. Technical superstar. Examples of technical superstars Kurt Angle, Shelton Benjamin, Rob Conway, Rene Dupree. <laughs> Eugene. <laughs> 
Charlie Haas. Orlando Ch <laughs> Not Orlando Jordan. I skipped ahead. Kenzo Suzuki. If, if you if you didn't watch wrestling back in the day, like man, I, if you've never seen Kenzo Suzuki, and you may shit, you blink and you miss that guy, he sucked. Oh my god, he sucked. Technical superstar. On the level of Kurt Angle, Kenzo Suzuki, and Val Venus. <laughs> the technical expert, Val Venus. Hello, ladies. <laughs> you know something, ladies? The big Valboski is a lot like Big Ben. <laughs> You put two hands on him, and the big Valboski always tells you what time it is. <laughs> oh, Kenzo Suzuki. <laughs> and manager. Because that's what I want to do. When I, when I play Know Your Role, hey guys, yeah, DM didn't show up. What do you want to play? Well, I want to play Know Your Role. Who you want to play, Paul Heyman? <laughs> Actually, that may not be such a bad idea. Oh, God. Um, okay, but I was going to the skills. Okay, so, so right away, this game falls apart. Because the combat shit doesn't even apply. Like, half of the combat system is movement and positioning. And there's none of that in this game. Because you can't, you can't apply the normal rules of movement that the D20 system employs in this, in this particular arena, like literally this arena, you know, um, it, it doesn't work. I mean, I, maybe with a, some time to think about it, you could adapt it, but I, I guess they had some time to think about it and they couldn't adapt it. Um, so the second place this falls apart is the skills. Cause now you have to, you have to twist and contort the skills of the D20 system to fit these classes, and then find a way to make them work in a wrestling game. Okay, so I'm just gonna read some of these skills off to you, and then, uh, then, then just try to see if you can figure out how these are supposed to work in an actual game. Climb. You actually have to put points in a climb skill. And here's what happens if you don't. A climbing is important now, like in a cage match, because here's what happens. Like, okay, how hard is it to climb a cage? Okay, here's the here's the difficulty check to climb a cage. Okay, a rope with a wall to brace against is five. A surface surface with ledges to hold onto or stand on, such as a ladder, is ten. Okay, ten. Meaning, climbing a ladder is difficulty 10. Now, that may not seem like much, especially if you're a strong guy. But, like, if you're a strong guy, like, wrestler, strength 14, 15, that's a plus 2, plus 3. And you'll say you put no points in climb. Okay? That means you're still, like, plus, let's say plus 3. That's pretty good strength. You put no points in climb. You still need to roll a 7 or better. To climb that ladder. That's still a pretty healthy opportunity for you to fail to climb a ladder. <laughs> Oreo is upset by this. <laughs> it's I know, it's bullshit, right? Come here, Oreo. You gotta help me review this game. Yeah. See? Oreo's very displeased. Yeah. Hang on. Well, I mean, I don't know if you outright... Yeah, you, I mean, you'd have to fail by five, I think, to fall. I, I think that's usually the way it is in the D20 system, but, like, it seriously would still be so embarrassing to not make 
the DC to climb a ladder. I think if you don't, I think if you don't pass the the, the difficulty, you don't fall, but you don't make any progress. So like, imagine how embarrassed you're. Like, I can't, I can't, ah, I can't, mm, ah, no. It's a ladder, you know. Like being, imagine being completely fresh in a match. You set the ladder up, and then you're like, how does ladder work? Ah, and then. The difficulty for a cage is 15. Now, like, if you don't put any points, even if you did put points in the climbing skill, that's tough. Climbing a cage with a difficulty of 15. Like, if, okay, let's say you're plus three strength or whatever. Yeah, it's, climb is a strength check, by the way. You know, so... You've got a strength check, so let's say it's plus three, and you got four points in you know your your climbing skill. You've 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 jacked points into this thing. You've you've ranked it up, so that's plus seven. You need an eight to get up there. Shit, man. <laughs> that's still like you gotta. It's it's like like forty percent likely to fail. That's not good, man. That's like, it's tough to get up that fucking cage. Wow, that's man, it's it's tougher than you'd think. Um, concentration. And actually, concentration is really important in this. More important than you might think. Now, see if you can think of how you would apply concentration to the wrestling game. Time's up. Now, I I, I couldn't think of this either. But this actually could be the most important one. Because outside a match, you make a concentration check whenever you might be potentially diverted while engaged in some action that would require your full attention. Meaning, let's say, you know how in every wrestling match, when somebody, like, diverts your, like, let's say you're in a match and you're about to win and then somebody else's music plays. Pardon me. And then, you know, the wrestler's attention goes to the screen and they're not looking. And then the bad guy like sneaks up behind him and rolls him up and they get pinned and they're like, what the fuck? I didn't see that coming. Concentration check. That's how the guy knows to keep their focus and not look up at the Titan Tron and to keep their focus on. The, so like they know they don't lose a match that way. Although I just pulled that out of my ass to make sure that, you know, that's diplomacy. Big time important in a wrestling game. <laughs> disguise you know when you're uh when you're when you're disguising yourself as Sin Cara Negro you know and when you're pretending to be Sin Cara and you're not that's big time important or uh you know if if you're gonna dress as like uh if you're gonna dress as CM Punk but you're not and so like when you want to come out on the Titan you know when you come out on the stage pretending to be CM Punk it, it determines how long people, the crowd believes that you're CM Punk before they realize that you're not. That's big time important. Yeah. Escape artist. Use the skill to slip out of handcuffs. Escape holding cells and locked car trunks. <laughs> Hide. Use this skill when you do not wish to be found by another character. Like Hornswoggle. He hides under the ring. I intimidate. Because wrestlers aren't intimidating. Jump! This is one of my favorites, by the way. The description for this one. Jump. Use this skill to vault fences or walls or leap pits and chasms. You have to do this a lot in the WWE is vault fences, walls, or leap pits or chasms. Look out for those pits. Because, well, I mean, now that I say that, Paul Bearer died on national television by being pushed into a chasm. When, when Edge had kidnapped Paul Bearer and then Kane pushed him into a chasm. That's one of the many times Paul Bearer died. One of the other times, one of the other times was when Undertaker killed him by burying him in cement. Paul Bear's died a lot of times, but the last one was for real. 
that was sad. But yeah, he's been killed like three times now. He kind of stuck this time. Anyway, knowledge. Perform. Like dance. Like Fandango. Musical instrument. Porno. I mean, promo. Porno can be Val Venus. Singing. Or vignette. You shine in a backstage skit and can convince everybody of almost anything. That you have amnesia, that you're joining a certain faction, etc. Okay. Okay. Sense motive. This is a fascinating game all of a sudden. Use this skill to tell when somebody is bluffing or lying to you. Because the WWE is all about subtlety and intrigue. Like, it's me, Austin! This, oh, this is... Oh, by the way, this... Actually, this is... The, I'll get into the the major unbalance of this game in a second. But this is actually sleight of hand. Now, I know you're laughing about this one already. Like, what the fuck is the use of sleight of hand? Sleight of hand is the most important skill in the game. I am not shitting you. If you play this game, get sleight of hand. Max that shit out. Dead serious. Dead serious. Speak language. You gotta understand what Tajiri is saying. Treat injury. Well, you know. Speed up your own recovery or help another character shake off stun effects. So, like, when you've been... When somebody else has been cranked over the head with a chair, you gotta help... Hey, wake up. <laughs> that, that's that's literally what this skill is. Just, like, wake up, dude. Tumble. Which is not the same as jumping. Tumbling is not the same as jumping a chasm. Tumbling is diving, rolling, somersaulting, flipping, and executing other types of gymnastic moves. Now, if you have both, you could tumble over a chasm. <clears throat> you could tumble over a chasm. But that that's a synergy. That's a synergy bonus. Which is a D20 system thing. I'm not even going to get into the feats. Which, um, well, among the many feats are... The titles are the best part of them. Like, Can of whoop -ass. Crafty, extra finisher, because why not, heat machine, intestinal fortitude, which I think they cheapened out on set, set of testicular fortitude, <laughs> master of the hold, move set, quicker than a hiccup, Spectacular entrance! Wait, wait, wait. You have a very impressive ring entrance that brings the fans off their feet in anticipation. Elaborate, exciting entrances such as those of The Undertaker, Triple H, John Cena. His entrance is not spectacular. Really. Whatever. Tenacious. Testa oh, testicular fortitude! You have the guts to fight off blows that would knock an average superstar for a loop. Okay. I was wrong. I apologize to know your role. Okay. So, the way this works is really just like... Honestly, it's just like... Well, like Kenzo Suzuki. They, they use Kenzo Suzuki against Rey Mysterio... It, oh, Fatal 4-Way. Rob Van Dam, Rey Mysterio, Kenzo Suzuki, and Rene Dupree. This sounds like the worst match ever. <laughs> okay, not the worst match ever, but, but like, any match with Kenzo Suzuki is, like, a top contender already for the worst match ever. Like, trust me. Kenzo Suzuki. Suffice to say, this is just, like, you roll for initiative, then you pick... You just pick a move, you roll to hit, and if you hit, you do damage. And then it just kind of keeps going like that. Um, 
it's a little more complicated than that, but not really. It's like where it gets complicated, you basically do damage to one another, just kind of going back and forth. And then where it gets complicated is you're, you're just kind of wearing each other down to the point where you're going to go for a pin or a submission. And then you, then it gets complicated. There's almost like a mini game that goes into, that goes into play when there's either a, a pin or submission. So, um, with, with the pinfall, there's, you have to go through what's called a three count, obviously, but in this case, there's, you have to do, um, the three count is, uh, the person being pinned, first off, the person, <clears throat> sorry, the person going for the pin has to successfully grapple with you to get the pin attempt begun, you know. Then, for every count, on a count of one, the person being pinned has to make a saving throw. Either will, fortitude, or reflex. Okay? So, they have to make an opposed... Uh, they have to make an opposed saving throw against the person making the pinfall. That person rolls a strength roll to keep you down. Okay? So, it's basically strength versus the reflex or strength versus whatever saving throw and you get to pick whatever saving throw it is so you get to okay so the person rolls uh, and actually what i don't know is if you get to pick which one it is before or after okay when you successfully hit a pinfall you as the pinning superstar roll a strength check adding the base attack bonus this becomes the dc Okay. Okay. All right, so that actually makes it a little more strategic. So the person making the pinfall rolls their strength check and makes the... You know, so let's say I get a 23 on my strength check. Now that I know that, um, the person getting pinned can choose either reflex, will, or fortitude, and they have to make that saving throw to either beat or... to, to beat that number. If... I succeed, I kick out, and the pinfall's over. If I fail, that count succeeds, and we go to the next one. And that person rolls again, and I choose another saving throw to make. The catch is, I cannot choose the same one. I have to choose from one of the other two remaining saving throws. So if I chose Reflex, I can never choose Reflex again. I have to choose between Fortitude or Will. So the, str the, strat the strategy there, the strategy there is I have to save my good saves for the good rolls that that the aggressive player makes, if that makes sense. So, you know what I mean? The problem is, the, the problems there come in a few ways. Natural 20 always succeeds. So the person holding, the, the person making the pin cover, if he rolls a 20, holds you down. Um, and that person, the, the, the person getting pinned does not get a roll then. The person can always kick out on a roll of 20. So there's always that. Um, <laughs> Oreo's freaking out. Um, and the, So there's always the chance you're going to get screwed. So if you get screwed on your good roll, you're kind of fucked. You know? Um, so I guess there's always that random chance, and I guess that kind of goes in with the... That kind of goes in with just... You know, the dice can always fuck you, but it's kind of unsatisfying from a wrestling point of view and, like, you're in a really big match and you just kind of like, oops, I botched, whatever. I guess it ends in a body slam. You know, whatever. Um, <laughs> Oreo. It's like, wrestling's boring. <laughs> but um, where it gets funny, however, is the pinfalls I was talking about only go this way assuming everyone's playing fair. But not everyone plays fair in a wrestling match. There's always a baby face and a heel. Not always, but almost always. So, now let's assume somebody's cheating. Which is going to happen. Okay. So, let's say I'm cheating now. Um, so, then what the player can do is, if I'm doing something illegal, let's say I'm holding the tights, you know, which is something that happens in a wrestling match. So you, you pull the trunks up and give them a wedgie or something like that, and that... That's illegal. That gives me more leverage, and that makes it easier for me to pin you. Or I put my feet on the ropes, which, you know, allegedly gives me more leverage. It makes it easier for me to pin you. 
So what that hap what that does is where is that? Let's see. Pinfall. Okay. You spend an endurance point to you know. Okay, yeah. Okay. The one thing you can do is you can spend an endurance point to hook the leg for an automatic one count. They don't get a save. So you have to spend an endurance point if you still have one to do that. So if you have one, you're always going to do that. It's immediate one. If you want to cheat, you can make a sleight of hand roll to secretly cheat without the referee noticing. If you succeed in this, this is another automatic count. Here's the thing. The DC for this is 15. This is why you always want to have... Uh, I believe sleight of hand is dexterity. It's either that or charisma. It's dexterity. This is why you want to be a dexterous heel. Like, have, have an 18 dexterity heel. And then dump four points immediately into fucking sleight of hand. Because you need eight points in sleight of hand. Guaranteed. Because the first thing you want to do for a pinfall is hook the leg for one. And then, you know, uh, and then, you know, hold the tights. And then, you know, roll, you know, you have plus eight there. You need to roll a seven to get, to get the sleight of hand roll. And then you've got an automatic two count. You know, right away, you only need to make one successful save but here's the other thing this is what the book says now each uh you can also try a dc sleight of hand check to either pull the opponent's tights or use the ropes for leverage each successful check also reduces the pin count by one anytime you fail such a check however the referee catches you stops the count immediately and ends the pin attempt so the worst thing that happens if you get caught it just breaks up the pin um Oh, in any case, the target has always at least one chance to escape. Okay. So, yeah, you always get one chance. So, you can cheat twice. So, if you don't have an endurance point to spend to get an automatic one cut, you can actually cheat twice. So, you can you can do the sleight of hand thing twice. You can put you, you can do pull a tight feet on the ropes. Get an automatic two count. It's fucking crazy. So, you're going to do that every time. Y you might as well. Why would you ever do it fair? So heels have such a huge advantage in this game. It is bullshit. It is bullshit how much of an advantage heels have in this fucking game. Just reading this, and it's almost like the like it says like the game is like it it talks like oh the heels should never do this. The the heels are it goes like uh, if if the heel is especially ballsy, he could try to cheat again. And I'm like ballsy Man, if he has any brains, he should do this every fucking time. Because all he has to do, he doesn't have to roll a strength check. He doesn't have to spend endurance. All he has to do is roll. He doesn't have to make an opposed roll. He can do this against anybody. He could hold anybody down with an unopposed check. So, like, if I'm fighting fucking Big Show, I'm fighting fucking Goldberg, doesn't doesn't matter who, I'm making a DC-15 unopposed roll two of them potentially i could hold anybody down for a two count and all i have to do after that is make one successful opposed roll just one and hope you have a bad roll just one that's that's a lot better than hoping i make three successful opposed rolls you know now the thing is like if your dm is worth a crap or, you know, your game master, wave, I, I would say DM. If your DM is worth a crap, and you keep winning matches like that, yeah, then you could probably have the, you know, the, the general manager, like, do something about it. You know, like, you know, you keep cheating, you know, you, you know, maybe no disqualification match, or, you know, have some kind of outside enforcer referee or something like that, or, you know, your DM could do something about that, but, like, in the rules, there is nothing stopping you from just abusing the shit out of this. Or having, you know, somebody else do this to you. But, yeah, baby faces, such a huge disadvantage. 
Although I think baby faces have th have a bunch of things where they can kick out of pins like crazy, but still, it's not quite. I don't care how many times you can kick out. Just having to being able to cheat like crazy like this. I don't care how many times you can kick out. All I have to do is make DC 15s to get an automatic two count. Shit, that's crazy. Um, like they introduce a bunch of different kinds of matches, like cage matches, false count anywhere. But like, it it just doesn't matter because it's it. It just says, you know, falls kind of anywhere. It's a street fight. Competitors can fight anywhere in or out of the ring, but it it doesn't it doesn't matter because it doesn't detail anything that goes on outside of the ring. You know, it doesn't provide any maps for what happens outside of the ring or what what kind of stuff is out. It doesn't detail what happens like it, what happens if you get you know thrown through the Spanish announcers table. It doesn't say, you know, um, you know what's under the ring. It doesn't say. I don't know if it. It just doesn't. Um, yeah, it, it, so... Sample maneuvers list. So it, it it gives this list of maneuvers, but you just, you're just kind of supposed to pick off this list what maneuvers you're going to do at any given time. It's And in this way, it's kind of... It's just kind of a menu, you know... And in this way, you're just kind of supposed to cooperate with one another to tell a story. So, you know, in, in some way, I could just keep doing forearm smashes if I like forearm smashes. It'd be the most boring match ever, but if I just really liked 1d6 damage and plus 2 staggers and stuff like that, I could keep doing that. It just... whatever. It's not a very good story, but... You know, and a lot of these, you know, from a from a statistics point of view and honestly what i'm looking at here this is a lot this is a lot like uh enzigiri well it yeah it's a lot like yeah whatever but you know it's these moves you're just you're just kind of picking you know um slap Wow, a slap hurts, man. Ability modifier damage plus three. It doesn't have the staggering power of a chop, but is otherwise very similar. A favorite among WWE divas. It's pretty devastating. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, sharpshooter. The Rock has one of the deadliest sharpshooters in the WWE. Hang on a second. I gotta look up something here just for my own edification. Oh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Sorry, I had to, I had to figure something out. But you know, um, stunner cutter, as in the Stone Cold Stunner. <laughs> stunner slash cutter, St as in Stone Cold Stunner or Diamond Cutter. And then it goes. Randy Orton is very good at the cutter. AKA the RKO. We couldn't mention Stone Cold or Diamond Dallas Page, even though we call it the Stunner or the Cutter. Then we could then we called it the RKO. Oh my God. Anyway, yeah, we got we got all these, you know, all these moves are just kind of interchangeable, and this is kind of where it goes back to EFED territory. Is like you know, with EFEDs, you kind of got these people just kind of cooperating to tell a story here. And this is almost where it, it kind of doesn't matter anymore what the dice are. You know, it's it, when you've got people kind of booking their own matches, which is fine. Um, it, but in that case, why are we rolling dice anymore? You know, you're just kind of telling a good story. Um, I don't know. In in some ways, this game is kind of unnecessary. Uh, what Another thing I like about this game is um, leveling up, which I, I don't... I, Leveling up is kind of hilarious to me in the sense that when you get level 20 characters, yeah, you level up to level 20. So I'm curious to know what level John Cena is. Um, also, the uh, the championship belts are magic. The uh, They give you powers. So like the, uh, 
the World Heavyweight Championship belt gives you a reputation bonus of plus three, and the benefit of it is once per show you can add your reputation bonus to a die roll before rolling. And it gives you a bonus feat. Popular appeal. So they all have different they all have different magic bonuses. Which actually kind of makes sense in a way. Um, once per show, a non-participating ally of your choice can interfere in your match without risk of ejection or your disqualification. The women's championship lets you do that. Huh. That's stupid. Huh. So, anyway, the last thing about this uh, book that I found really funny is the uh, the last chapter, which details a number of wrestlers in the back and gives their stats. So you can try to kill them if you want. So the uh, you have The Rock, obviously, Triple H, and my God, these guys look young. This this was printed, I don't know what year, um, but it obviously it was 2005. And Jesus, these these guys look so much younger. It's it's really remarkable. And it's also remarkable that uh, these guys are still, like, hanging around. <laughs> you know, uh, Triple H especially looks really haggard nowadays, and he's probably still going to be main eventing WrestleMania. Good Lord. Um, yeah, Chris Jericho, Edge. Let's see, Rhino. Seriously. Tajiri. By the way, you're going to... I'm going to tell you... You're going to see people who are here, and then I'm going to tell you who's not in here. And that's going to really, really surprise you. Trish Stratus. The Hurricane. <laughs> okay. Jonathan Coachman. Because I always wanted to play the coach. Eric Bischoff. Earl Hebner. We gotta have Earl Hebner, and it's it's good it's good we devoted an entire stat block to Earl Hebner because all of his stats are ten. Space well used, but he has Iron Will. He has the feet Iron Will, <laughs> and he has no finishing maneuver, except screwing Shawn Michaels. Eric Bischoff. The Undertaker. Oh, and The Undertaker's stat block is really fascinating as well. Because he has a strength of 21! In 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 D D rules, his strength is 21. Now let me go look and see. According to according to uh this particular you know this particular game, what 21 amounts to in terms of deadlifting. Does it even give... Does it even break that down for you? I have to know. Know your role. Abilities. Weight class. 10? 21 strength for the Undertaker. Oh, it doesn't even... Okay, it doesn't... <laughs> okay, it doesn't tell you... Normally it would tell you like how much you could lift with a strength of 21, but hang on. I'm going to find a D&D &D book and tell you how much that would let you lift ordinarily. Oh, I don't have a third edition book back here because third edition sucks. Damn. Hang on. Oh, Pathfinder's close enough. Pathfinder's basically third edition, kind of. So if I had a strength of 21, how much could I lift? How much could the Undertaker lift? Come on. Where is it? This is going to be worth it. So worth it. Where is it? Ability scores. Determine bonuses. Strength. Where is it? It just has the fucking... Damn you, Pathfinder! 
Why does it not say? Uh, supposedly this is... I stuck up for you, stupid game. You know what it did, is it... Put it all in, like, a different chapter. Ugh. Additional rules. Fuck. I know. I've completely blown this whole gag. Motherfucker. Ugh. Damn. There we go. Carrying capacity. Finally. 21! A light load for the Undertaker. Something he could carry around comfortably. 153 pounds. <laughs> Medium load, 306. And the most he could carry moving around is 460 pounds. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah. So Undertaker has a strength of 21. And uh, what else does he have? He has a constitution of 20. In AD&D, he could almost regenerate. Although he is the dead man. So that was that was totally worth it. Dude has a strength of twenty one. The the twenty is how he can sit up after the most insane punishment. Let's see. He has concentration of fifteen, intimidate plus twenty. That's because of his dong. You know. Dong Dong. You really cannot underestimate the power of the Undertaker's dong. It's it's massive. It's, it's really terrifying, The Undertaker's dog. Anyway. <laughs> He's got the talents Badass and Big Badass. He's got both badass talents. <laughs> oh my god. His moveset is Big Boot. <laughs> Dragon Sleeper, which he doesn't use anymore. Flying Clothesline, which he only does once a year. And I don't even know if he'll do it this year. Dude's getting on, man. Well, the dude's not getting on. He's on. Man, I, I, I don't know about this year, man. Him and Brock. I, yeah. I've been saying he should have retired at 20 and 0. Like, yikes. Old school forearm smash. Soup bone punches. Kurt Angle. Eddie Guerrero. <laughs> Big Show. What's his strength? 24! Oh my god! 24? <laughs> oh, fuck it. 24. Okay, you win, sir. Bubba Dudley, Devon Dudley, and then Tori Wilson. I, for some reason, when I first saw this game, I laughed my ass off when I saw Tori Wilson in here. Because her charisma is 18. I didn't laugh nearly as much as I saw this. I think just because I braced myself for it again. But if you've seen Tori Wilson, she's an attractive lady. But her charisma is not 18, sir. <laughs> it just is not. And then there's Paul Heyman and Teddy Long. And that's it. You know who we didn't see in there? And that's a long list is, oh, I don't know, Stone Cold Steve Austin, <sighs> Chris Benoit. Now, I say that, I say that un unironically, considering that they actually use Chris Benoit as an example in virtually every single example that mentions technical wrestling in here. So, like, every time they mention, like, a submission hold, they mention Chris Benoit. And this was before the whole thing, obviously, so don't get started on it. But I was like, I was really expecting to see Chris Benoit in here. And yet, we have room for Earl Hebner and Tori Wilson and The Hurricane and... Who who else did we have in here? Did we have Bob Holly, Bischoff. Bischoff, I don't mind. He'll beat the shit out. Rhino, Tajiri. Coach! Yeah, the coach. I was always wondering about him. But, like, the gaps in this game are just... Why Why no Kenzo Suzuki? I ask you. Because, you know, the un-Americans, they, they made such a big deal of... Why not the Bashams, please? Why did we not include the... Why not the Gemini? 
no Stephen Richards? Hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it, the thing is, this is this is where you know you could say what you want about the combat or the bad skill system or whatever, but I think where they really failed on this game is the fact that. I think all that we really wanted from this particular game was to see stat blocks of the wrestlers. So if we wanted to, let's say that we were going to do the WrestleMania card, right? For that year. So like if we were going to run down the fucking WrestleMania card of, you know, of, uh, of this particular, of the, of the year that was mentioned on this other book. You know, what if we just did a thing where we went down, you know, Undertaker and Yokozuna or something like that, and we just role-played that match out and got those characters out? I would expect in this book to have just a basically a book of all the wrestler stat blocks listed out. I would like that. You know, the game could be a pile of shit, but I would like to see a book with all the stat, the, the stat blocks listed out. That would be kind of cool. And yet they just have like kind of a, not even a half-assed, like a quarter-assed list of a really strange selection of of wrestlers laid out. And I'm just like, I don't get it. Like, okay, Big Show and Triple H and then Coach. And then Tori Wilson. And I'm just like, it's, it seems like a really scattershot collection of character. Man, I just didn't understand it. And, and they're not even all main eventers. Like, if, if you were going to pick like if you were going to pick a small selection of them, I would think you would pick all main eventers or even like the major players. No, John Cena. No, maybe, maybe John Cena was not as big as he is. Like maybe he had just started at the time. This had came had Maybe he was just getting started and he wasn't quite the John Cena. He is now, but like, you know, there's a lot of major stars that were going around at the time and they're not in here. Um, no Randy Orton. You know, um, really kind of remarkable. No Vince McMahon. If you're going to put, like, management characters in there, or, you know, valets and stuff like that, where's Vince? Shane? Kane? I don't know. Like, but yeah, so this, it's, this game is really more remarkable in what it leaves out than what it brings in. This game is, this game is not good. So, um... I might bring this video to a close and uh, and start a new one to cover the other WWF game, or I might just, uh, depending on how long I've rambled on this one, kind of whatever. But uh, here's the next one. Um, see you soon. <laughs>